I'm really, I'm really excited about uh, this conversation that's coming up. Um, we're actually going to get a chance to talk about another real world instance in which approval voting was was used. Um, we're going to put our time machine hats on a little bit and go back to the 2015 Republican Liberty Caucus National Convention, um, which took place obviously before Fargo, before St. Louis. Uh, and I think what happened there really does demonstrate uh, the impact that approval voting can have both on campaigns, election results, and the candidates. Um, so before we get started with the presentation, I want to uh, go ahead and introduce uh, the three folks who are on our, our panel. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Blake Huber. Uh, Blake Huber is, has had an interest in politics almost his, adult, his entire adult life. He's been involved in political campaigns since uh, he was 17. Um, he's, he's been a longtime libertarian activist who found uh, out that he was a, a libertarian after hearing Roger McBride, the second uh, libertarian presidential candidate ever speak in a radio interview. Um, he's also served as the chair of the Libertarian Party of Kansas and served as the Libertarian, uh, served on the Libertarian uh, Party National Committee. Uh, additionally, we have Steve Cobb with us. Uh, Steve Cobb is originally from California, but uh, worked many years in the former Soviet Union as an engineer in the area of arms control. He's been a voting reform advocate for some 20 years, including uh, about five years on the board of CES. Uh, he's a founder of Unsplit the Vote, um, a swarm-based movement uh, that promotes the evaluation of voting methods to end vote splitting and its consequences. And then lastly, we have Andy Jennings. Uh, Andy received a PhD in mathematics from Arizona State with a dissertation on voting methods. Uh, he was a founding board member of the Center for Election Science in 2010 and served on the board for seven years including as its chair. Uh, he has twice attempted to get approval voting uh, bills through the Arizona legislature and is currently working on another approval voting initiative in Arizona. So um, that's, a good, that's a, a, a good introduction to our speakers. Um, to begin with, I think it's good to get everybody a little bit of background ab uh, uh, about this Li Republican Liberty Caucus and uh, Kind of, how did this all come about? How, how did they use approval? Uh, how, how did it come about that they were going to use approval voting? Uh, was there a specific vote split that happened before? And how did uh, CES get involved? Um, Steve, I think you uh, have some great background information on all of this. Yeah, so I was in New Hampshire um, back in, in 2011 and pretty active in GOP politics mostly. Um, and at the, the state GOP convention back in 2011, they had a straw poll and it's, it's always a big um, kind of a, a fun publicity event. But so far, you know, a year before the election, there's a million candidates. I mean, literally they had, I think uh, 28 in that year. So when they use plurality voting as always for these straw polls, you get this horrible vote splitting and each candidate gets just a few percentage points. Um, so it's, it's hardly meaningful, um, but it's, uh, it's kind of a publicity event in the, you know, in, in the convention. Uh, so that year I participated in one and uh, actually we, some of us ran a parallel approval poll unofficially, which was somewhat frowned upon by the, uh, by the organizers, but uh, we, we produced actually uh, much more interesting results, um, you know, more accurate results showing the true approvals of each of the, of the candidates. So when the RLC National Convention came up in 2015, uh, we'd had that experience and I, I knew the organizers, it was, it was in New Hampshire by, by coincidence. So um, yeah, so I pitched the idea to them as a way to make their straw poll real, you know, not, not just a publicity event, but to, to make the results meaningful. And that would actually make it a bigger 
um, publicity event. Yeah, we get, we get the word out because it actually was uh, was uh, was meaningful. Um, and also having an outsider like CES run the poll gave it more credibility. An yeah, outside expert. That's great. That's uh, that's really interesting. Um, can we get sort of started uh, on kind of talking about uh, a little bit about what it was like kind of getting ready for this event? Um, Andy, I know you were tasked with designing the ballot and, and the counting mechanism and, uh, and all of the, the pre-event preparation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, up until this point, the Center for Election Science had been a very, very, very theoretical organization. Um, I don't think we'd ever run an actual uh, poll or election of any kind in real life. And so they wanted us, they wanted our organization to do it for the um, for the ex uh, expertise that we had. So we decided, well, how are we going to do this? We had to, um, we, we went and found um, an excellent open source program actually that could read the ballots and then we found um, a scanner where we purchased a scanner on the for the CES nonprofit and we took it with us to to New Hampshire and we had this program that was going to count the ballots uh, excellently and you had to put these you had to put uh, black corners on your ballot but other than that you could have a pretty standard um, you know circles that, that get bubbled in um, yeah so Mike's pulled up the ballot here um, you can see the black uh, marks in the corner. That was just, that really, really helps the software to read this. And so everything else was a bubble. Um, we decided that we were gonna run uh, a plurality election at the same time as an approval voting election and a score election. And so that's why there's three columns. We hoped to design this so it didn't confuse people, but we told everyone and they announced that the approval voting results were going to be the real results. Everything else was for research purposes. So the middle column there, vote for one or more, was the uh, was the approval voting section um we also wanted to make sure we were kind of official in terms of making sure that people who were allowed to vote got to vote and no one who wasn't allowed to go allowed to vote got to vote and so we came up with a system where we we printed a thousand barcodes and steve and i held on to those tightly those were the control item and then when people came into the convention and were allowed to vote, we would we would check their name off the list and give them a barcode at the same time and they had to put the barcode on the sheet in the top right corner in order for it to be read. And the software that we found could read that barcode and could put it all, could put all the votes into a into a CSV file and count them quite quickly. And so, um, yeah, we, we showed up with a thousand barcodes and a thousand um, sheets of paper. It meant we didn't have to be as careful with the sheets of paper. These could be, um, these weren't the control item. They could be handed out and shown to people and, and given out. It was just the barcode that we had to be careful with and control item. So we, we think we did a pretty good job. Steve went and found uh, a ballot box that locked and we put a padlock on it, I believe. And so they folded up, they put their barcode on, placed their votes, folded up their ballot, placed it in the ballot box and they knew that it was secure. Um, they knew that uh, everyone could only vote once and, and no one who wasn't allowed to vote could vote. So we think it was a pretty good, a pretty good setup and a pretty good run for our for our first election here. We also at the end we scanned all of the ballots and we put them online for a period of time so you could um, type in your serial number and see your ballot image online and you could see all the other ballot images and you could make sure that they were all you could check the CSV and make sure they were all tallied correctly and all that. So we wanted to have an, an official process that was secure but also you know we wanted to illustrate transparency. So we were striving for all of those things and I think we did I think we did pretty good on all counts there. Yeah, I mean that sounds like you said that's about as transparent as it gets. That's uh, that's pretty great. Uh, well, thank you. That's that's really interesting. It's it's quite a complicated thing to put together. So um, that's that's awesome. Um, and then, so it's my understanding that um, the Rand Paul and Ted Cruz campaigns they came to this campaign. Uh, really looking to win, right? They they, they showed up uh, with a lot of people. Um, how did 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 they know there was going to be approval voting beforehand, or was this something that they learned uh, at the at the event? And how, how did the, how did they react to uh, to learning that it was an approval voting uh, contest? Yeah, we we made this agreement with them um, 
somewhat in advance, but not, not very far. So, so the campaign certainly knew they had time. Um, of course, this was supposed to be Rand Paul's victory, right? Um, he, you know, he's the more libertarian candidate, his father's Ron Paul. Um, so he was pretty confident of winning it. But approval voting gave the Cruz campaign, it gave Cruz the chance to upset Rand Paul, right? Because people could uh, vote also for their second choice. So even though Rand might be most preferred, if Ted if Cruz could get the um, enough um, approvals and then bring in more of his own supporters, right, to uh, sort of higher turnout from his campaign, he could he could uh, he, he could tip the balance, upset Rand Paul, and that would be a big media uh, story. Yeah, and so, so that's how it started the 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 the, the, the turnout war. And uh, speaking of that, it's uh, according to the numbers, it wasn't it like a massive uptick in uh, in attendance and and uh, turnout. Triple the expectation. Triple. Yeah, their 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 previous maximum had been about two hundred fifty, and they were expecting that for this election year, and they got nearly eight hundred. So and those you, are the, the two campaigns. And um, you think approval voting probably. Uh, helped to uh, inspire that turnout? Unquestionably. I mean, it was the whole package, right? It was uh, just, it, CES's uh, participation and the use of approval voting just really raised the profile of the, of the straw poll from being just kind of a little gimmick at, like at most conventions to uh, you know, uh, a central event. Sure. Uh, so uh, Blake, I've got a question for you. You, you had a, um... You had a table at the event, and I know we're talking about six years ago. Um, but uh, as you as you hear, do you remember hearing anything about from individual voters that were talking about uh, their experience casting a ballot? Any any kind of murmurs in the crowd as uh, as they were considering uh, how to approach an approval voting ballot? Sure. And I remember it really well, even though it was six years ago, it's like it was yesterday. So people would come up to me and they'd say, how do I do this? They tell me I should only vote for one, but how do I do this? And so we went through the ballot. I explained to them, you vote for all your favorites. You cast your support for each candidate that you believe in or that would represent you. And each situation, it's not a zero sum game. It's not win lose. Each situation, you're supporting a candidate. And if you want to elect the candidate that has the broadest popular support, you express that support. And the fear that you, that you really need to be concerned about is if you support two candidates, but you don't vote for both of them, a third candidate could come from behind and knock out the one you favored the most. And so a lot of people really understood that. They were confused, but it was great. It's probably worth explaining a little bit what, um, I mean, the campaigns, this was important to them. So they started calling their supporters. They started asking their supporters to come down. Um, there was a lot of recruitment going on. And so people would come uh, just just for this straw poll. They would come and, and the first thing you would do is walk over to their campaign, the one that had called them and asked them to come down there. And so if they were, a, if they'd been called by the cruise campaign, they would walk over to the cruise table and ask the cruise table, what, what is this? I've never voted in a in a in an election like this before. How does this work? And the cruise, the cruise campaign would tell them, oh, just just bullet vote for Ted Cruz. Put him for your plurality vote. Him for your approval vote. Put him for your five score vote and leave everything else blank and turn it in. That's and and the Rand Paul campaign was doing the same thing. They were calling people and they were getting people there and they were um, people were showing up. So when Blake says that that the voters were saying this guy's telling me to vote for just one. Um, that's what was happening is it was the campaigns who were going and trying to get a hold of the voters and trying to tell them how to vote. We, um, it was fascinating to find a few people who were brought in by the campaigns and would come up to us and be like, I want to learn more about this approval voting. And we could, Steve or I could explain to them what approval voting was. What that second column is you can vote for all that you like. And then, and then we can have a much fairer election because the candidate with the most support is going to win. 
Um, and there were people who were brought in by the campaign and they, they would whisper to Steve and I, they would say, the campaign's telling me to just vote for one, but I'm going to vote for, I'm going to vote for all of my favorites. I'm going to vote for three or four. And when the room was too busy, we could send them over to Blake and be like, oh, you want to learn more about approval voting? Go over to, go over and learn about approval voting from Blake. So there was several, um, there was quite a few voters who, who learned about approval voting and liked it better, even though they were brought in by the, by the campaign. So that was kind of the dyna dynamic that was going on. And it, was it was it was it sort of chaotic uh, as the as the vote was happening or or uh... <laughs> yeah I think Andy would agree it was pretty chaotic. What I really found interesting is the people who came in brought in by the campaigns did bullet vote in many cases, but the long term Republican Liberty Caucus members those are the ones that really wanted to do it the correct way and they wanted more information. To explain why I was there and, and manning the booth, Frank Atwood and I in Colorado uh, started doing ApprovalVotingUSA.org uh, for many, many years. Uh, I met him at a libertarian event when I first moved to Denver a dozen or so years ago. I said to Frank, you're nuts. You'll never get this adopted. You're wasting your time. Let's work on electoral college reform. He offered me this book called Gaming the Vote by William Poundstone. Anybody watching this video, if you get that book, it's like $7 on Amazon for the Kindle version. Read that book. You'll learn about the wizard and the lizard. You'll learn about all these situations that come up where splitting the vote is so very bad. And then I read the book. Three days later, I called Frank up and said, Frank, I've drank the Kool-Aid. How can I help? <laughs> so it was a ma major change from, nah, this ain't going to happen, to what can I do? And for the last 10, 10, 10 years or so, Frank and I've been touring around the country. In fact, right now, I'm camping in Washington in the approval voting van. <laughs> so you're still out there, right on. Yes, sir. You bet. You can tell I'm in my van right here. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Very awesome. Um, so I'm curious about the count. So now you, you, you have, and not the count from Sesame Street, but the, uh, but the, the, vote, the vote count. Um, you... You have this uh, this approval voting event, and then so how did that all go? Can you talk a little bit about how the campaigns were reacting to the counting process? We now know with uh, all the chaos of this last year uh, how important that that can be. So um, tell me about how that was. Yeah, when we went to count the votes, um, we ended up running them all through the scanner. The scanner worked great, um, scanned them all in about five minutes and put the results in a CSV file and we could import it into Excel. And we had the results in about, in a, probably in about a half an hour. But there was a step before that because the campaigns um, didn't trust the scanner and they didn't trust us and they didn't trust the program and they, they didn't trust anything. So before we ran anything through the scanner, we, we had this, there was this big boardroom table. I'm gonna share my screen here so we can see. Um, there was this big boardroom table and we took out the ballot box and we plunked it down on the table and we unlocked it and we pulled out all the ballots and we, we set out this pile of 800 ballots. And then one of these gentlemen was from the Cruz campaign and one of them was, was from the Paul campaign. And they both wanted to see me count every ballot. So we went through that stack of 800 and we divided them into four piles, the piles that voted for both Paul and Cruz, the votes, the, the ballots that voted for neither Paul and Cruz, and the ballots that voted for Paul but not Cruz, and the ballots that voted for Cruz but not Paul. So those were the four piles, and we we divide them all up into those into those four piles. And then we hand counted the ones that mattered, which was to them the ones that voted for Paul but not Cruz, and the ones that voted for Cruz but not Paul. So we had these four stacks, and then we we were we wrote down the count to satisfy these two campaigns and then we turned around and ran everything through the scanner real quickly and it it went but it was fascinating that we could do both right like we could do an electronic version of the count and it went great and we could also do a hand count a hand count version of in this case we knew who the two front runners were and so we could divide the ballots into four piles um that's um that's not quite as easy as plurality voting where every ballot is a mutually exclusive you know Paul or Cruz or neither or both can go in the same pile. But, um, and if there was three candidates that cared, then you got to divide things into eight piles or, or seven piles or things like that. There gets to be more piles, but it's much easier than, than ranked choice counting by hand or score voting counting by hand. It was very, very convenient to count these ballots by hand. These campaigns, whenever I would put, put down a ballot that voted for 
Cruz but not Paul or Paul but not Cruz, they were fine. I would put down ballots that voted for neither. There was a few of those. And then I would, anytime I would put down a ballot that voted for both Paul and Cruz, they would both shake their heads. They were, you could tell they were both thinking like, if this wasn't approval voting, you know, this ballot may have voted for me, but not him, you know? So there was this, um, the, the campaigns, they want loyalty, right? They want, they want to call people and get their commitment, get them to commit to vote for their candidate and no one else. And that's that's just the way the campaigns operate is what we realized. It was fascinating to be a part of that and to see that dynamic going on. But this is how we this is how we counted the vote here was with the, the hand count and then and then the computer count after that. That's wild. Uh, I can I can imagine uh, uh, having them just watching you like a hawk as you're as you're counting every ballot. That's, that's fascinating. Um, Let's see. So uh, let's uh, so then let's talk a little bit about the results. Um, basically, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here, and we'll take a look at what the results look like. Oops, hold on one second. Just lost my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, share. And so, as you as you said, you did a um, you did the star the uh, plurality voting, the approval voting, and the score score voting. And you can see uh, a little bit of differences um, with each each different voting style. But we see that uh, that Rand Paul comes out ahead. But but again, I think the most important thing to note is that you do get that information that we that we miss when you're talking about approval voting with the uh, with the plurality uh, uh, system. You get to you get to see a full view of what uh, of what the voters actually wanted. And so, um, were there initial any initial surprises to you uh, about the uh, results when they were tabulated? You're probably asking about uh, Gil Fulbright. <laughs> that's, that's, I love that. Is that what you're hitting at? Yep. Yeah, well that, um, yeah, that was a satirical candidate being run by an organization you may have heard of called Represent Us, uh, represent.us, uh, really great organization, great people. And um, so they brought some fun to the event. They had this satirical candidate named uh, Honest Gill Fulbright. And they paraded him through the event. And uh, yeah, it's, he, I think he's a comedian, a professional comedian. And um, so he wasn't in the original uh, ballot, but uh, they had people writing him in. <laughs> and uh, they begged us to, to count those write-ins when we did the tallying. So, okay, throw him a bone. And turned out, Gil got uh, he got more votes than Jeb Bush. <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty embarrassing, and uh, that became national news. Poor Jeb. The end of Bush's campaign. Yeah. When when you look at those results, it was interesting. After we finished counting the results and we made the CSV file, we realized you have to be very, very, very careful what you use for the denominator in an approval voting election, especially one that was not that that not that many people um, over the number of approval votes were not that high over the number of voters. Right? You have to be really careful that the denominator is the number of voters not the total number of approvals. That's the first mistake that a lot of people make. They put all the approvals in a column of their spreadsheet and they do a sum and then they do another column that's dividing the, the those columns by the sums. And if you do that, then no one will ever get or only one person can ever get above 50% approval. So we had to make sure that we were careful when we did the when we did the spreadsheet and we tallied up those votes so that at least two candidates could get more than 50% of the vote. And we felt like it was, it was legitimate. I mean, both Cruz and Paul were approved by the Liberty Wing of the Republican Party. I thought it was fair for that early in the election cycle when, when you had that many candidates and that many uh, and that that wide of a field and, and it was unknown who was the who was the front runner. I think it was great that they both got the approval of of the Republican wing of the of the Liberty or the Liberty Wing of the Republican Party. So um, 
we were super proud to announce those results. We also, we wrote out specifically the verbiage that they were going to share at dinner when they announced the results, because you have to say, you know, you don't want to say the winner with 57% of the vote. You want to say the winner with 57% approval and second place with 53% approval and, and, and that kind of thing. So we wrote out the actual verbiage that they could read and we were careful. But I think um, as approval voting gets more well known, those kind of things uh, will also be more well known and will I understand. work themselves out. There was a little bit of gamesmanship with uh, once the results came out, uh, the Cruz campaign uh, tried to make it seem like they won because they got over 50%. Yeah, the Cruz campaign did instantly tweet out like, uh, like Ted Cruz gets 55% at the Republican Liberty Caucus and um, tried to tried to get that out before the official results and tried to make it look like he was the winner because 55% people 55% to most people means means he won so they were trying to kind of take advantage of the approval voting but yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just struck by by this and the other approval voting elections that we've seen that you, you really do get a, a broader perspective on where people are, and especially at that point in that in that uh, nomination contest, the polls that were out will paint a, a specific picture because everybody has to pick one. But that really is the first time that people were able to give a full on look. At, uh, at where that primary stood. And of course you see that, um, that Donald Trump uh, didn't really register much at the time uh, among that wing of the party, which is, uh, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I, I just think that's, uh, that's really quite, quite indicative of, uh, of the value of approval voting. Yeah, one of the main things when you look at those results is um, in, with plurality voting, none of the other candidates got hardly any votes, you know, 1% or 2%, but with both approval voting and score voting, the rest of the field could see their true level of support. They were getting 20, 15, 10, they were getting a true level of support. And it was, it was distorted because it was the Liberty Wing and um, Paul and Cruz were both trying to win and they were both, you know, recruiting for this election. So it wasn't a, but it, it was, I think, an accurate representation of that wing, but it was fascinating to see like true levels of support for all of those other candidates. It was just so much more valuable information comes out of an approval voting election or a score voting election. Um, and it was just great to see all of those, all of those other candidates get, get votes and get true level of support. And that's what you need at that level in the, in an open prime, in a big primary, right? You need to see levels of support for all of the different candidates. You don't, you don't need to narrow it down to front runners yet, which is what the media tries to do. And so we were super happy with the, with the nursery effect, the ability to, to see levels of support for all candidates. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we, we talked about the Liberty Wing of the Republican Party. Uh, Frank and I actually, is this a good time to talk about a conservative poll we did? Okay, sure. so Frank and I were at the Western Conservative Summit in Denver uh, just before the debates. And we did a poll, who should be on the stage in the debates? And you brought up the, um, the where you saw Bobby Jindal had like 17 percent approval. So we did a comparison between plurality and approval. And Bobby Jindal was not marked on any of the ballots for plurality. Same as we saw in the on the com uh, comparison you just showed. Yes. Go down to Bobby Jindal. Ben Carson was marked on 28 percent for score, 18 percent for approval and zero on plur plurality. Ben Carson won among the conservatives. He beat out Ted Cruz. I think it was 68 to 62 percent, very close, but he beat out Ted Cruz. Bobby Jindal got zero votes on plurality, but he was marked on 50 percent of the voters by 50 percent of the voters on the ballots uh, when they could vote for more than one. So and what the, the big takeaway from that event was you could see three different categories, three different um, areas where the people that were on the stage were in the top third. It was a very clear distinction. The second third were people that were on the backstage and the third group, the bottom on the approval voting ballot, uh, represented by these people at the conservative summit, were not seen ever he uh, heard from again. So approval voting, but people allowing people to show their true support for individuals, you'll get a really good idea of how much support they'll have long lasting. That's, that's, a, that's a perfect example. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, so 
one so the big the big uh, question I, I think that everybody has from from each time we we get a chance to do this is is uh, lessons or impressions that uh, that you got from the experience. You know, uh, I assume you would call this a successful event for approval voting, um, right? Why or why not? Customer was satisfied, I and mean, that's the most important thing, right? That's and that's both the you know the organizers who you know we were the client, as well as the uh, the participants. So they, they got a result that they could believe in. You know. And is there is there anything that jumps out at you from this experience that would be uh, instructive to CES and the supporters on this on this call? And uh, just curious. Well, for me, I went to Porkfest soon after this event, uh, maybe a year or so after. And a gentleman there who had been at the RLC meeting in New Hampshire came up to me and said, Blake, I want to do this right. How do I do this approval voting poll that I want to do at Porkfest? So that's implementation of something he heard about. Now, if you want a bigger, I don't think there's any better way you can say this was a success, successful event based on that. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the people, when people hear, hear about this, they, they just really like it. Um, a lot of people hear about this and just feel yes. liberated to, to vote for all the candidates that they like uh, this early in the election to say who they're, who they're voting for. I mean, I think it was instructive. I hadn't realized the degree to which campaigns would react and would um, maybe oppose <laughs> approval voting and oppose the idea. One thing that we didn't see, um, it would have been nice to see three serious campaigns uh, kind of competing for this election. I think um, if you, you, there's this effect that can happen where there's a there's someone if, if Ben Carson would have shown up would his campaign would have shown up and kind of contested this they could have gone to these voters and be like hey vote for Rand Paul and Ted Cruz one or the other vote for your favorite but come on also also vote for Ben Carson they can they can make these phone calls which is like yes we're not your favorite but you know we're good approve us also you know I think it would have been nice to see I think that's going to happen in real in real elections with approval voting is the these campaigns can make calls for people and be like we don't have to be your favorite but you know we're good just just approve us also it would have been nice to see that effect kind of show up in this election and it, it didn't it was just mainly a one-on-one -on -one, but um still grateful to see the other the other campaign still you know had a great much greater turnout with approval much greater results so and another yeah. quick comment from the Western Conservative Summit, a gentleman, when he finally got what approval voting was all about, and it's so simple, it's difficult to understand, right? So what he did, he finally said to me, okay, I think I get it now. So I can vote for the person that I think is the most ethical candidate, and then I can also vote for the one they want me to vote for, right? <laughs> and my comment to that was, you've got it. <laughs> I like it. That's, that's perfect. Um well, so those, that's the end of the, uh, the questions that I had drawn up. I want to open it up to uh, everybody who's with us to uh, ask some questions of our, of our speakers, if you have anything. I, um, I'm not, I don't see anything specifically in the chat at the moment. Okay, so we do have one from Jeff Justice. He says, at the time, how was Trump polling among the Republicans nationally? If I remember correctly, he had he had just kind of made it serious. He was in the single digits in national polls. I I don't know anyone that I talked to that actually thought he was a serious candidate um, to actually win. It was it was fascinating to put him on the ballot um, to see the results and to see where he placed. The other um, the other funny story about Donald Trump was when a man wandered over from the hotel. This was not a Republican Liberty Caucus. Um, ticket holder at all he he did not have the right to vote but he wandered over from the hotel asked us what we were doing asked us what approval voting was asked us what the ballot was he was he actually had an accent and he was from russia and he was wearing a putin shirt just a just a picture of of vladimir putin on his shirt and he asked us about the election and um he took a ballot and he he cast a vote 
he didn't have a barcode because he wasn't a member and we couldn't count his vote, but he handed it back to us. He had bullet voted for, for Donald Trump across the board. And so I thought that was, that um, it was this fascinating experience that kept coming back in my head as, as Donald Trump started doing, you know, better and better in the primaries and then was president. And then there's these Russian ties that are coming out in the press. It was just an, an experience that kept coming back to me was this Russian man who loved Putin and loved Donald Trump. And that was his, that was his thing. We didn't, we did not get to count his vote, like I said, but he was, he was there at the hotel. It was, it was interesting. A precursor of things to come. <laughs> does, uh, does anybody, if you want to, um, uh, Caitlin, can we give folks the ability to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question? Sure. Um, and we do have a quick question here in the chat from Sass who asked if there are plans to use approval voting with the same group of people in the future. Um, and I don't know of, uh, of that, but I think it would be absolutely, um, awesome if, if we could make this happen again in 2023. Yeah, I think, I think we will definitely, uh, be approaching them to, uh, to try to redo the, uh, the experiment with the, with the next field of candidates that comes along. Well, my question to SAS is this. Why don't you do an approval voting poll, Sass? Just get in there and just make it out. You need help. Reach out to the Center for Election Science. Reach out to me. Reach out to Steve or Andy. We'll be glad to help you get it set up and get it run correctly. Oh, you have uh, you got no idea. I'm actually um, working with uh, Pat Dixon and Rock Howard down here to get approval voting for Austin City Council yes. elections. Yes. Oh, yeah. I push, I push approval voting on a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, I was playing poker last night. Everybody was sick of he hearing me talk about it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there before I'm like, I can keep going. <laughs> uh, um, just, Justin did ask earlier if, um, how the organizers were convinced, the organizers of the RLC were convinced to use approval voting. Um, I gave him an answer, uh, I gave an answer to Justin, but I, you guys might have a fuller response. So did you need to convince them to allow us to add that approval and score voting, the, the approval and score voting options? Actually, I, the, the vice chair and the organizer of the event is a personal friend of mine. So he'd already heard the pitch re repeatedly, you know, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, so he was already pretty convinced. He just had to convince the organization. And you know, for the reasons that we, we, we've mentioned, you know, it's, um, it, it was just upside for them. Yeah, I, I guess the only potential downside would be if people weren't familiar with it and were kind of suspicious about this thing. Um, but you know, unlike some of the more complicated voting methods with a, with a you know, complex tallying algorithm, it's, it's almost a black box sometimes. Um, this is pretty obvious, right? So um, it didn't take much to, to, to for him to sell the uh, leadership. I thought it was interesting. Steve, Steve, yes, like we said, Steve talked to the organizers and knew the organizers and negotiated for how this was going to work. And one of the things Steve negotiated for was we get to give an hour talk to the whole, right. I mean, these are in breakout rooms, right? So it wasn't like everyone was in a dinner and I got to give an hour talk. It was It was just a breakout room and a lot of, you know, six or seven other talks were going on at the same time. But Steve negotiated for me to give an hour talk about approval voting and, and voting systems and voting methods. And so they scheduled it. It was a good time when they scheduled it. It was like Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. or something like that. And I was preparing my talk, at which point Rand Paul announced that he, he, he was coming to visit the conference at on Friday at 1.30 to 2.30. So Rand Paul was coming and everyone was excited to see Rand Paul. I half wanted to go see Rand Paul's speech instead of my own, but um, <laughs> everyone went to see Rand Paul and I went down to my room at two o'clock and gave a gave a presentation to, I think to Blake about, uh, about approval voting. Um, so our talk did kind of get preempted, but there's no one I'd rather be preempted by than a, than a presidential candidate. And it was fun to be there. It was fun that they made appearances. Um, it was it was fun to be involved. It was fun to get to introduce approval voting to this to this crowd. Yeah, I, I would have gone too, Andy. I just thought I was stuck at the table. Yeah, Steve <laughs> had to run the booth. <laughs> Somebody had to run the booth, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, I have uh, posted in the chat a good write up. Oh, uh, let's see. 
Looks like we got another uh, question. Uh, what is the feeling of other approval voting supporters in regards to the gained popularity of ranked choice support? Um, uh, and is it a is it a diversion from duo voting or a push against it? I'd like to take a crack at that. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. We'll we'll, we'll all be polite toward them. Don't worry. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So, you know, if you walk, if you go, go down certain streets in any, any metro area, you'll find all the car dealers are gravitated to that one street. And why is that? Because people come to shop for cars. They don't want to go to one dealer. So if score voting, star voting, rank choice voting, if they all start getting popularity, what's going to happen is we're going to diminish the interest in plurality voting. So I'm in favor of rank choice voting putting their, their ideas out in the, the, the marketplace of ideas. Uh, approval voting, in my estimation, is superior to all other cho uh, choices for many different reasons, L uh, lowering costs, et cetera. And it gives the people the, the ability to truly express themselves. So I think approval voting will always win out in a head-to-head -head match. But yeah, bring it on, ranked choice voting. If you like ranked choice mm -hmm. voting, go for it. If you like store or star, go for it. If you want to talk about approval voting, give me a call, <laughs> but be ready for a long conversation. I could, I could add something to that. There, there, there is no one best voting method. The, the, uh, the, the right voting method depends on the, the election you're having and the electorate, the size, the sophistication, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of parameters that determine the right method to use. And you know, CES, we've been talking only about one of CS's five consulting gigs. And um, at least three of the other uh, gigs we did involved other voting methods. Um, you know, some, some crazy methods that were designed for the occasion. Like I'll mention for the, for the Hugo Awards, uh, Jameson Quinn designed. Um, so nonetheless, there are certain patterns and you can see that there's some voting methods that are much more likely to be useful. And if, if you ask me, um, what's the best voting method for an election where, you know, uh, I don't know the, the details of that, I'd say, well, probably approval voting would, would be best. Uh, so where would instant runoff voting be appropriate? Um, it's, it's the method that scales, say scales, transitions to a multi-winner uh, system most elegantly as far as I know. Andy, you're the expert here. Um, so instant runoff voting for a single winner election is not great. It's a lot of complexity for only marginally better results. But if you want a multi-winner election, a uh, proportional with proportional uh, representation, then IRV scales to uh, STV and uh, that could be useful in some circumstances. Andy, maybe you could expand on that. Um, yeah, I think uh, as soon as you have multi-winners, um, ranked voting can actually kind of smooth out some of its uh, difficulties and anomalies. Um, in my in my experience, like like looking at approval voting and looking at ranked choice voting. Um, I mean, I've examined a lot of situations recently and it's like, oh, approval voting struggles in this situation and instant runoff struggles in the same situation, right? Like it's a tricky situation for any voting system. There's the ones that both voting systems get right. There's the ones that both voting systems kind of kind of have uh, a little bit of a problem with. And then there's the situations where one is slightly better than the other. Um, but I mean, to me, it just seems pretty obvious that approval voting has all the benefits of ranked choice voting. And it's just so much simpler to implement, right? Like in Arizona, we're talking about, there's a ranked choice bill down at the legislature and they're talking about new voting machines and completely new ballots and and uh, educating everyone about how uh, ranked choice voting works. And, um, and, then, and then when you get down to brass tacks and you go to implement it, a lot of times they only let you vote for your top three, right? It's not the theoretical ranked choice voting that the mathematicians study, it's only the top three ranked choice voting, which is, which is even more problematic, right? And so it's 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 the expense and it's the voting machine complication and it's the counting complication, it's the it's the ballot complication. It really is like I just try to convince people approval voting has all the same benefits and it's just way 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 simpler 
um, to try. And if you can convince your legislature or your initiative or whatever to go to go for ranked choice voting, like I love to see experiments done. I love to see it run. I love to see the results. I think it's good for math and for voting science to to have ranked choice voting elections happening. And the more data we can get, the better. Um, but when it comes down to it, like all the same benefits with like just. But if you're going to have a ranked, if you're going to use a ranking method, which ranking method would you choose? You know, a Condorcet method or or IRV? Yeah, there's there's that whole discussion I mean, too. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I like to look at, I'm a photographer. So what's the best camera you can ever have? It's the one you have with you. So what's the best voting method you can possibly use? The one you always have with you. Hey, let's see a raise of hands. Candidate A, raise of hands. Candidate B, raise of hands. Candidate C, raise of hands. You're going to always get, from my estimation, I'm not a mathematician, but I read books and I read what mathematicians do. And I tell you, approval voting has it all. You want to get into the weeds and go to RV, RCV, whatever, STV. Um, I think Andy has brought out uh, proportional uh, approval voting. Uh, there's a way to do it for multi-winner elections. Thomas Jefferson and Daniel Webster both worked on proportional approval voting methods back in the day. Hmm. So it is possible. But I don't like multi-winner elections. In fact, I don't even like to call them winners because with approval voting, when we get to express ourselves, we win. The candidates get elected, but we win. Sure. Uh, well, I think we're all going to get a, uh, a good look at how things go with IRV in, uh, in New York City soon. Um, it's just interesting. A friend of mine sent me a photo of the uh, sort of voter education stuff that uh, is being sent around in New York, and it, it looks like a clothing catalog. It's, uh, it, it's extremely... Uh, huge. So I, I, I'm really fascinated to see how that all goes uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Which will be heavier, the New York phone book or the New York ballot? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really, like I really like when you said, um, you know, with choose one voting, candidates win. With approval voting, voters win. That's I love right. that. That's exactly. a yes. really great line. And we always get the person with the broadest popular support because you can vote for everybody that truly represents how you feel or that you think has the best resume for the job. Amen to that. Uh, well, are there any other, any other questions out there? I have a question for everybody watching. When's the last time you used approval voting? Did you try with your group to go to go to the same movie, watch the same TV show? Did you use approval voting? Mm -hmm. When I was married years ago, we would just try to decide on what movie to see. We went once a week to the movies. I made up my list. She made up her list. We found out where we matched. And if we matched on two or three, this week we saw this one, that week we saw that one. We didn't have to negotiate. Well. Uh, we saw my movie this week, so I guess I'll have to watch your movie next week. <laughs> Didn't have to go through all that angst. We just used approval voting. Use approval voting every day. <laughs> Love it. Uh, well, I, uh, thank you to everybody uh, for, for attending our chat, and uh, especially to Blake, Steve, and Andy for sharing their thoughts. I think this was a really, uh, really fun conversation. Um, like I said, I posted a link to a good write-up on the uh, on the event. And if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to follow up with me at mike at electionscience.org, and I can get uh, uh, get your questions over to the panelists because they're the experts. Um, and with that, uh, I'll go ahead and and uh, shut it down. All right. Great seeing you all again. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.